In 2010, Dirk de Geest and Anne Doris published an article in Poetics Today entitled Constrained Writing, Creative Writing, The Case of Handbooks for Writing Romances. In this paper, their primary interest was in thinking about writing in the genre of romance, but by extrapolation in any genre, as constrained or limited by norms, expectations, or rules external to the text itself. But their findings are equally interesting as an, as an analysis of the writer as expert or participant in genre. The imagined readers of the romance writing manuals described by de Geese and Goris are invited to constrain themselves to the norms of romance as they write, not under duress, but because understanding these norms makes engaging with that genre as a writing rewarding and potentially commercially viable. De Geese and Goris identify three main trends in the handbook's instructions. One, the continuous appeal to the aspiring author's own experience of romance reading. Two, the conception of writing as a craft and a profession. And three, the infrequent but strategic recourse to overtly normative language. Notably, the romance handbook writers wrote with an assumption of expertise on the part of their readers, framing their advice as a systematization of the understanding that their audience already implicitly had, including them in a group of insiders. The guide's audience of aspiring writers are constructed as having a deep knowledge of the genre because they're already dedicated, savvy consumers and fans of the novels like the ones they wish to write, and they wish to write them well, maybe properly, for their target market. At the end of their paper, de Geest and Gores call for analyses of handbooks for other forms and genres, pointing out that such a transgeneric approach would lay bare certain convergences and general assumptions about writing, and perhaps reveal the substantial differences that separate various literary genres. My paper today takes up this challenge by analyzing a set of manuals for writing children's books. My project is less interested in genre conventions or constraints per se, and more interested in that figure of the novice writer that the handbooks imagine. But my hope is that it will spark conversations about how we think about writers, not authors in the technical or theoretical sense, but those people who sit at keyboards and attempt to make stories, and also money. De Geest and Goris's conclusion about the writers imagined by the romance handbooks was that they were assumed to be knowledgeable, experienced romance readers who wanted to try their hand at a craft they respect. This is very different from how potential children's book writers were framed in most of my sample manuals and handbooks. I'll unpack this in more detail over the rest of this presentation, but even at first glance, the contrast is striking. In my set of texts, writers were anticipated to want to tell stories to children or publish books in a general sense, but to have little to no understanding of the publishing industry, and in the starkest contrast to the romance writers, to not be readers of, or even mildly familiar with, the genre of children's literature. The handbooks in my sample were largely supportive of adults becoming writers for children on little more than their having once been children themselves or knowing children in their families or social circles. In just a couple of the newer books in the sample were children's books written about with the assumption that the genre was worth reading for pleasure and that useful insight would come with interest and experience. I sampled eight of these manuals, which ranged from an entry in the long-running Complete Idiot's Guide series to slim, conversational, self-published books of tips. Although guides like the ones I looked at emerged several decades ago, I opted to read only those guides published in the 21st century. Some were by published children's book writers, others by editors, others by agents. They share some basic assumptions that their audience audiences want to write not only for their own private amusement, but for eventual commercial application. Some of the differences in practical advice can be attributed to changes in normal business practices over a period that saw the rise of the internet, which moved publishing from a post-based concern to one that used mostly email, and that saw a general boom in children's literature in the aftermath of Harry Potter's success. One of the functions of most of the manuals in my sample was about the mechanics of going about becoming published. Sometimes this was a core focus, other times it was more peripheral, but most books contained in some instructions for steps in the process, how to format manuscripts to send to publishers, what elements needed to be in documents like query letters, how to get an agent or whether to, and how to discover the strengths and focuses of individual publishing houses or editors. Etiquette and business practices were of high concern here. How does one submit a, a manuscript properly? How long does one wait before nudging an editor? Under what circumstances might your manuscript be returned to you? How can you promote your book once it's published? And so on. 
So that's one way that the manuals were constructing the prospective writer as an industry newbie, unversed in the way that the business is usually conducted. This isn't really surprising here, right? You would expect that a key role of manuals like this would be to educate a reader about an opaque field that they definitionally wouldn't have had any firsthand experience of. But there were other constructions that were more surprising, and that's what I'm going to spend the balance of my time going through. This requires some reverse logic. I'm assuming that these manuals intend to give novice writers information that they don't already know, as with the sections on posting manuscripts or on finding agents. Stated conversely then, the readers of these handbooks are constructed as probably not knowing the information that the manuals contain. This sounds obvious, but it goes somewhat against the observations of the romance manuals, which De Geest and Goris described as being more chummy and inclusive of their readers. That wasn't a tone that was evident in the majority of my sample. In the end, I found four things, four more things, about children's books that most of these handbooks expect their readers will probably not know. Firstly, and to be transparent, somewhat gallingly for someone who's an unironic fan of children's books, the manuals in my sample tend not to assume that prospective writers have experience with the genre, or that they're voracious and expert readers of the kind of books they want to write. There are various ways this manifests. Sometimes becoming familiar with the current trends in children's books is suggested as tactical, a market research endeavor. Sometimes readers are asserted to know enough about children's literature already just by virtue of having probably read some children's books as a child. For example, Aaron Shepard is largely mute on the topic. His audience is one that intends to write children's books or perhaps already has and is looking for advice on professionalization and monetization. His advice to read lots of current books in the genre and age group you're writing for is perfunctory and given in the context of building a career. Marion Crook focuses on the writer's desire to tell stories, informed mostly by what they've gathered through informal learning, and refers only glancingly to reading done in order to learn about how children's book wor books work. Her recommendation to become familiar with the genre is at best implicit. She writes, most writers are not formal students of children's literature with knowledge based on university studies and usually don't have rigid classifications, i.e. of age category, in mind when they write. They want to communicate with readers and they burn with a story to tell. Usually writers of children's stories have absorbed the different categories of children's literature from their own reading. Lisa Bullard advises becoming regular at your nearest bookstore and library, but only in the context of networking and learning about forthcoming new titles, trends, and ideas about what children are asking for from employees rather than through extensive reading. Harold Underdown similarly advises reading children's books in order to develop a taste for what will sell, what is engaging, and what an individual writer might want to write. Even when familiarity with the genre is argued to be valuable in a more general sense, this is advice given to a reader who is imagined to not already be on board with this idea. Barbara Suling titles an early section of her guide, Gobble Up Books, and advises her readers to read old books and new ones, popular stories in literary classics, good books, and bad ones. For her, the point of this exercise seems to be to calibrate the writer's sense of what is expected in children's books, what is normal, what is mainstream or more edgy, and what's effective or not effective about other writers' writing. In short, this is an exercise in developing a sense of genre and a self-reflexive opportunity to evaluate one's own writing skills in light of many published works. Underlining a lack of expectation in previous fluency, Sewling also provides a chapter which discusses the history of children's literature as a genre and industry from a pretty academic perspective. Cole, similarly, sees an understanding of the state of play to be crucial to success. Cole's very first lines of chapter one put a fine point on this. She says, writing does not in exist in a vacuum. The savviest aspiring writers must have a serious understanding of their intended market, not just their craft. This echoes what De Geest and Goris might identify as an, an overt norm, although it differs from their schema in two ways. First, as I've mentioned, it's not framed in such a way that assumes that the readers of the manual already possess this expertise. And second, it's a norm applied to the writer, not the writing. The second and third commonalities between the guide's construction of their readers as inexpert are smaller in scope, but underline just how little these prospective writers might know about children's books of the moment. 
an apparently pervasive myth, myth the manuals bust, and therefore presumably that they believe their readers at least might believe, is about the inherent simplicity of writing children's books and the attendant ease of writing them. This is a particularly strongly stated statement when it relates to picture books, which Shepard emphatically asserts are the hardest because they demand conciseness, simplicity, and a visual sense, but applies to children's books more generally too. As Underdown puts it, with a little bit of prickliness, sadly, many people don't understand that creating books for children is as significant, challenging, and absorbing as any other form of creative endeavor. Although in context, Underdown is encouraging prospective authors to take themselves seriously despite outside detractors who simply don't have the same insight that we do, this sentiment also serves as a slapdown to readers who might suspect that, although they want to write for a young audience, it won't really be real writing. If Underdown is prickly, Crook is pointed about the risks of setting the bar of expectation too low. Some authors of children's books, particularly beginning authors, talk down to their readers. An aura of condescension permeates the writing like nauseating medicine, forming an unappetizing subtext. Yikes. A related assumption is that children's books are all about moral lessons. The manuals almost universally reject moralizing stories while acceding that ethical or emotional learning might still happen along the way. Bullard ca cautions writers against lessons that are too overtly soapboxy, advising writers to make sure that the lesson emerges through the action and conflict built into your story, and not through a moment where someone, typically an adult, in the story interrupts the action to lecture the reader. Crook agrees. The danger in writing morality tales is that the writer may ignore the needs of children and write from behind a screen of righteousness that thinly hi hides a lecture. Shepard, in his characteristic blunt style, notes that good children's stories do not preach. Instead, they educate for life, as do good adult stories. Suling frames this as, an, as a matter of balance, acknowledging that while strong values can inform strong themes, rarely does a moralistic story break through into public acceptance unless the author has enough talent to pull the materials away from the didactic approach and make it something more than a sermon. In most cases, this advice is seen as so important and also so needed by the reader that it appears very early in the manual, in the first chapter or even the preface. The final commonality among manuals has to do with money. As I mentioned a minute ago, the handbooks I surveyed are generally as much about publishing as writing. That is, they're usually interested in teaching their readers how to professionalize their writing as well as simply writing for private pleasure. Underdown's final chapter is called Building a Career, as is the final section of the first part of Shepard's book. Cole's final chapter is entitled A Career in Kidlet. These chapters underline that although the manuals acknowledge that writers often want to write as part of a long-time, perhaps slightly romantic dream or personal aspiration, they are still insistent on framing the activity of children's book authorship as a job, an ultimately commercial enterprise. However, they're also sanguine on the possibilities of children's books leading to wealth and fame. Sealing does the math on the advance and royalties of a hypothetical hardcover novel, revealing that even a favorable contract may not yield any income beyond the advance until its third or fourth year in print, even if additional deals are made for paperback or other subsidiary rights. She summarizes the situation as follows. A large amount of money sounds good at first, but consider that everything you earn on this book comes over a period of two or three or even more years. You would need quite a lot of books to bring in a reasonable income. The fact of the matter is, for most people, writing children's books is not a lucrative business, but there are some writers who can earn their living at it. Some of the books specify what percentage royalties writers might expect from their efforts and what kind of contract terms they might be likely to negotiate for their first book, for series, options, and so on. Incidentally, this has declined over time from 10% of list price for hardcovers in 2000 to 6% of net sales for lucky first-time authors in 2016. All of these put together create a picture of the kind of writer that seems to be imagined by these how-to children's book manuals. That writer is looking for specific instructions on how to navigate the industry, who to contact, and what to send them. They're interested in nostalgically revisiting their own childhood or maybe a romanticized sense of the value of stories, but they don't read children's literature. They aren't familiar with subgenres, market categories, conventions, or trends. 
they want to make some money, but they might have inaccurate conceptions of what that would look like. Cheryl Klein's 2016 book, Magic Words, seemed to be the only manual of the eight which challenges the construction of the prospective author as essentially naive. Rather, she leans towards a position similar to what the Geest and Gores described. That is, she frames her audience as readers who were and continue to be deeply affected by the books they read and who want to have that kind of effect on readers. In contrast to Crook's opening anecdote about telling stories around campfires, Sewling's opening, do you want to write a children's book, or even Cole's advice that an aspiring author should know the market, as quoted above, Klein begins with the writer as a reader. What was your favorite book when you were a kid? Among writers, that's the best conversation starter I know. Matilda, The Secret Garden, Bud Not Buddy, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. People remember how they found the books. This class, that librarian, that former best friend. They remember what the books meant to them, laughter, heartbreak, recognition. And they remember how the books changed them, how the characters modeled the courage to stand up to oppression, how a novel became a safe space, a home. This paragraph is full of shibboleths. Each of these titles a test. Does it trigger a flash of memory or a blank space? Are you, reader of this book, a reader of those books too, like a writer would be? Two paragraphs down, Klein is even more explicit, switching to a direct second person address. You doubtless have a favorite novel yourself, a story that changed your life, that made you a reader and writer, that perhaps even inspired you on the path you're on today. Based on this approach, I'm tempted to conclude that Klein's is simply the best guide, the most respectful of children's literature as a genre that I think is worthy of respect and attention on its own merits. This temptation is made the more tantalizing by the degree to which Klein's mode of address seems to align her book with the romance manuals. In general, she writes as a person who both knows and loves children's books and thinks that if you're going to write them, you should too. This would be missing the point though and answering the wrong question. So the question I originally posed of this corpus of handbooks was not which of these frames writing for young people in a way that makes me personally feel warm and fuzzy inside. It was, what kind of person is imagined by these manuals? And what kind of relationship do they have with the books they want to write? For the majority of the guides I surveyed, only Klein meaningfully accepted, the person in question was the enthusiastic amateur with a slight or nostalgic relationship to the genre of children's books or no relationship at all. This seems to me a unique formulation that would be neither desirable nor really possible in other forms or genres of literature. De Geest and Goris imagined some essential similarities in writing and writers from a trans-generic standpoint, as well as, for, as some differences. This seems to be a substantial finding. While the writers of romance and probably other forms of adult literature are assumed to be knowledgeable first and aspiring afterwards, when it comes to children's literature, that's possible. Klein shows us it's possible, but it seems not to have been a prerequisite, at least in the period that my handbooks covered. Thank you very much.